Yo, 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 welcome to your Thanksgiving episode of Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. Today on the show, we're talking about Nike going into the metaverse, Odell Beckham Jr.'s lawsuit, the week's hottest releases, and of course, a hard pass. All right, let's start with Dot Swoosh. Nike is going to the metaverse, baby. Wait, is this November 2020 or 21? Why are we just hearing about this news now? Haven't they like been paying attention to the news and what's been happening over at Meta? Well, not Meta, I keep calling it Meta, Facebook. Not to mention all those crypto exchanges and NFTs that are now burning to the ground. This is the bottom dropping out, man. And now Nike is going all in on some Ready Player One nonsense? Well, of course they are, because they're Nike. And if anybody is going to make this happen, whether we like it or not, it's the swoosh. Or more specifically, dot swoosh. Okay, let's back up for a second and talk about how we got here. This past Monday, Nike announced swoosh.nike, or is it nike.swoosh, or wait, wait, is it dot nike backslash swoosh semicolon jump, okay, whatever it is, Nike just announced it. As you can see, off to a great start with the branding. Anyways, dot swoosh is, according to Fast Company, a community-driven new Web3 shopping platform where you can interact with, design some, and maybe even make money from digital sneakers. If you go to the swoosh.nike website right now, you can try and fail to sign up for an access code and check out their FAQ that also links to a blog on Medium. Everything about the presentation is designed not for the Web3 literate, but for the curious. We are recording this prior to a reveal of something that's taking place on November 18th. So we're gonna go ahead and wildly speculate about what this will all mean to you, to me, to co-writer and everybody really. Think of it as a sealed envelope segment. And if it turns out we nailed it, that's probably a good sign Nike's moving in the right direction and that we're geniuses. Because honestly, if they're gonna go a different path, we have our doubts that any of this is going to take off. All right, so. Nike is going to take the Luka Doncic approach to rolling out dot swoosh, meaning they're going to take things slow. It might not have the same aggressive, in-your-face, take-no-prisoners house style that's been a Nike staple ever since the days of Michael Jordan wearing banned Air ships, I mean Air Jordans, but it is the right move. Like Luka, Nike is going to slowly wear us down, lull our defenses into a sense of comfort and security, and when the time is right, boom. Luca is passing us by, going to the hoop, moving at 15 frames per second. In Dot Swoosh terms, we're signing up to pay 50 bucks for a pair of digital Air Force Ones that we most likely will never be able to wear in real life. But how are they gonna do it? They've already outlined some of their plans to educate the public on what they are aiming to do with Dot Swoosh. Understandably, all of this Web3 talk has a lot of people either anxious about trying dot swoosh or turned off altogether. That's why it's smart of them to get out there and say that all purchases will be in US dollars and not some nebulous cryptocurrency like swoosh coin or Nike bucks or co-writer coin. That's a thing, trust me. And with all the news about the sky falling on crypto and NFTs, there's gonna be a lot of outreach that needs to be done. None of that Steph Curry, I'm not an expert and I don't need to be nonsense. It's part of an initiative by Nike Virtual Studios, a new division headed by Ron Ferris, AKA the man behind the sneakers app. That team will be working with folks in LA, Atlanta, Charlotte, Tallahassee, Louisville, and New York to host sessions, hand out access codes, and explain exactly what Dot Swoosh is. And that's the big question, right? What the hell is Dot Swoosh? Is it the new sneakers? Yeah, how do we know this? Well, it's being led by Ron Ferris, AKA the man behind the sneakers app. It's been a long time, but do you remember how the sneakers app rolled out initially? You couldn't just download the app and sign up right away. No, you had to have an access code. Co-Rider and I remember when we got ours at a Nike event. It didn't feel that big of a deal to us back then. It was just another app that we had to have to buy sneakers. Sure, it was cleaner than the regular Nike app. It had editorial features and it gave us a brief head start in getting some sneakers over the general public. But it still didn't feel monumental until we got that first got a message. That was magic, but more on that later. According to the Dot Swoosh blog, it's a game. Dot Swoosh is a game. And in that game will reside Nike's virtual creations, which they define as interactive digital objects, thinks virtual jerseys and shoes that can be worn in video games and other immersive experiences. Dot Swoosh is where users will be able to collect those virtual creations and buy, sell, and trade them with others. Some will even have the opportunity to co-create these virtual goods with Nike and sell them and collect royalties. Take that, Kanye. How all that looks is still a mystery for all of us now. Again, we don't know what happened on the 18th, but here's what we hope it'll be. So let's take them at their word. Dot Swoosh is a game. 
It can't be some simple platform where all you're doing is looking at pictures of your shoes and exchanging money with others for more pictures of their shoes with zero interactivity. As fun as Marvel Snap is, I don't know how I'd feel if I was paying 50 bucks for a pair of Zoom Generations with the frame break upgrade. It also can't be those videos of people with Bored Ape and Artifact sneaker filters. That appeals to a very small subsection. We think Nike saw Fortnite and was like, hmm, what if instead of collaborating with Epic and letting them put our shoes in Fortnite, we made our own game, collect most of the money, and maybe throw some change at Epic to get them in Fortnite too? Our guess is that Nike is making a massively multiplayer online world where you have an avatar decked out in tech fleece and dunks and a residence that's called whatever your handle is dot swoosh. So if you see co-writer dot swoosh out there, you know who that is. Anyways, it's like a grown up version of what Nike is doing in Roblox. Think of a virtual recreation of the Nike campus in Beaverton, Oregon. You won't be doing zero build battle royales, but you might walk to the Michael Jordan building and check out the latest drops from Jordan brand earlier than even the blurriest of leaks. Maybe you head over to the LeBron James Innovation Center and play a game of one-on-one against the digital brawny. But most important of all to Nike's bottom line, you can teleport to the Nike employee store because they've got a limited edition digital version of Drake's certified lover boy Air Force Ones in black that you can buy for $50. Not only that, the $50 is also a deposit for a real world pair that's dropping in six months. And all of your purchases and pre-orders are stored in a digital wallet devised by Big Go and recorded on the blockchain, aka your digital receipts. Think real money for a digital sneaker that doubles as a pre-order for a real thing is far-fetched? It's not. It's an example that Ferris gave Fast Company. We just added the Drake part because... Hmm. Look, Ferris also says that he can see these digital sneakers that you buy in Dot Swoosh as appearing in other video games and metaverse experiences. Man. That part is the one that always trips up co-writer. As somebody who actually worked in the media space for a long time, he cannot fathom an environment where video game companies like Nintendo or Rockstar or Activision would allow a third party to insert their products into their game perpetually. First of all, the amount of work that it would take to create all of those art assets would be a programming nightmare. Like, could you imagine the team that created the Uncharted franchise having to dedicate precious time to make sure that Nathan Drake looks good wearing off-white Nike KD-15s? Does it even make sense for Mario to be wearing Prestos? Wouldn't there be an immersion break if all of a sudden you saw a pair of white cements in the next Resident Evil game? Look, those are extreme examples and probably not on the table. The most likely games we'll see with some sort of Nike integration are in titles that are sports related, open world environments like Watch Dogs that take place in modern settings, or those other metaverse experiences like whatever Mark Zuckerberg is spending billions of dollars on but no one seems to give a shit about because MetaQuest Pro headsets are $1,500, but I'm not mad about that. Seeing Nikes in GTA 6 might sound like a stretch, but if there's a company that Rockstar would entertain a phone call from, it's definitely Nike. And again, this is just us speculating and projecting what we hope Dot Swoosh can be. It's going to be a super niche thing for a long time because quite honestly, most people are not going to buy into this pitch that Nike is selling. Just tying it to Web3 and NFTs cuts their potential audience by a sizable amount. You can already picture the comments, right? So I'm going to take L's in the digital world and in real life, or, oh, it's a scam, or I'm not paying $50 for a picture. It's a tough sell, man. But Nike is betting on that magic kicking in. It's the FOMO of seeing your friends who got access codes getting digital and real sneakers on Dot Swoosh. It's the envy you get from checking out a kid in 2K who has on a Dot Swoosh exclusive sneaker. It's the potential when you see your buddy add Nike designer to their bio because they helped Tinker Hatfield pick out the color of the eyelets on a pair of Air Jordan 2s. And it's the rush of the got a message that pops up when they scored a digital pair of the Air Jordan 1 Dot Swoosh Chicago. Oh, you better believe they're going to make one of those. Nike has the time, the money, and more importantly, the patience. They'll wait it out because this is their big play into not just the future of sneaker shopping, but the future of how we interact with each other. Remember, Fortnite didn't start out as a player unknown Battlegrounds knockoff, but once Epic made that change, shout out to them for still making people pay for Save the World, they became one of the biggest things ever. If Dot Swoosh takes off, we're not just hanging out at Nike's virtual world to show off our kicks. We're also chatting, sharing, and flexing. And then it becomes a social network. And the sweet, sweet data that Nike could mine from us is too valuable to pass up. Buckle up, everybody. This could be Nike's final frontier or a disaster that we'll all forget by November 2023. And that's just the reality of things these days. All right, let's move on to the heat check where we bring you everything that's dropping this week. 
And first up, we have the Sporty and Rich Adidas Samba on the 22nd for $130. We have the Women's Nike Dunk Low Driftwood on the 22nd for $110. The Women's Nike Dunk High Burgundy Crush on the 22nd for $125. The New Balance 990 V2 and V3 made in the USA on the 23rd. The Nike Dunk High Bruce Lee on the 23rd for $125. The Nike Dunk High Blue Chill on the 23rd for $125. The Reebok Question on to the next on the 25th for $160. The Air Jordan 6 Metallic Silver on the 26th for $200. And then my pick of the week is the Nike ISPA since Phantom and Black, and then also in the Enigma Stone and Seafoam colorways on the 23rd for $200. Look, you all know me by now. One of my favorite things in sneakers for the past few years is whenever Nike gets weird with their ISPA line, and the sense is to borrow a DJ Khaledism, another one. Looking like a pair of kicks that could pass for DLC and Ghost of Tsushima, the sense is all about the comfy life, and I am here for it. Even if it is priced at $200, which bothers me a little bit. I mean, that's actually moderately priced compared to other ISPA releases, but it still bothers me. Now for a heat check on Odell Beckham Jr.'s lawsuit with Nike. The short version of the story is that Beckham is suing Nike because they allegedly did not live up to the terms of their agreement that began back in 2017 when they matched an offer the All-Pro Whiteout received from Adidas. Beckham's Nike deal, valued at $29 million, included a number of sales benchmarks his signature line would have to clear in order to trigger an extension. However, promises of an OBJ product line never fully materialized, save for a lifestyle pair of the Air Max 720. As a result, Beckham has never been able to meet those benchmarks, which he claims was intentional on Nike's part to suppress his royalty potential. At the same time, Nike is also accused of withholding money owed to Beckham and ultimately cutting him because he violated policy by not wearing the properly colored cleats during his half season with the Los Angeles Rams last year. Beckham contends it's because Nike didn't provide him with the properly colored cleats, so he had to get them customized. Man, remember when we thought it was a little curious that OBJ wore those diamond encrusted cleats during the warmups for the Super Bowl? Turns out he wasn't doing it to show off, but it was so Nike wouldn't cut him. As of this recording, Nike has yet to respond, but I'm guessing whatever they say isn't going to have the same level of vitriol and snark that they say for, say, a StockX or a Warren Lotus. Now, whether OBJ or Nike wins isn't really something we care about here on the show. What we're more interested in are the machinations behind closed doors at Nike and what the decision-making process was that led them to go down the path of not pushing OBJ harder as the face of their U.S. football brand. Was it a decline in highlights and production after an eye-popping start at OBJ's run? Was it the injuries? Was it a move to Cleveland of all places? Yeah, actually it was definitely that. Look, no offense to the land, I, I, I get it, but to go from New York to Cleveland had to have played a role in the calculus. Unless you're LeBron James, it's hard to make a national name for yourself when you play for perpetual losers like the Browns and those uniforms ain't exactly flattering on anybody. So really, if OBJ has anyone to blame, it's probably, look, I'm just kidding, Cleveland. It's your, it's not your, it's your, it's not, I love you guys. It's not your fault, but maybe it is. Anyway, it's time for this week's hard pass. We're gonna take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go, like the yearly rollout of the NBA City Edition jerseys. Over the past week or so, Nike and the NBA have been unveiling what each team will wear that represents the place that they call home. In the past, this was a joyous occasion because teams would tap local artists, celebrities, and landmarks to contribute to the process. We've seen some city jerseys become instantly iconic, including the Miami Heat's Vice uniforms, the Minnesota Timberwolves' homage to Prince, the Phoenix Suns' Valley jersey that was so fire they just ran it back a year later, and of course, my 17th time world champion Los Angeles Lakers' Black Mamba jerseys. At the same time, we've seen some truly let's say uninspired uniforms that have done the opposite of inspiring pride for their hometown. The problem is those bad jerseys used to be the minority. This season, they all suck. Okay, that's a little harsh, but I think this is a year that Nike needs to rethink the whole city concept. Sure, there are some okay ones, like the Memphis Grizzlies is particularly cool this season, and the San Antonio Spurs are thankfully embracing the concept of color with their throwback to the 1996 NBA All-Star uniforms. But the Lakers, it's so blank. And I, and I guess that's the point. Apparently the theme this year is blank canvas and it's supposed to represent the change makers of Los Angeles. I guess we couldn't get anybody to design a good uniform to lose in. So we just went with the blank slate, just like our win record. Sorry, I know I'm supposed to be the eternal optimist when it comes to the Lakers, but man, these uniforms are just not it. I'm sorry. The blank canvas is a far cry from the Mambas and it's amplified by the fact that the team is really, really bad. And to add insult to the losing, the Los Angeles JV team's City Edition uniforms paid homage to the Drew League. Like, how? 
The Drew League, aka the best summer basketball league in the world, is a Los Angeles institution. And you know what else is a Los Angeles institution? The Lakers. From Kobe to Lonzo to LeBron to Swaggy P, Lakers past and present have repped the Drew League. To have those two come together, even in a season as crappy as this one, would have been a very cool moment for those of us who have watched Drew grow throughout the years. But no, the other team got the nod for reasons that I'm sure are valid and probably really cool, but because I'm a Laker fan who only acknowledges Laker things in Los Angeles, I will never know what that's about. Yes, this is all a bit. Don't take it too seriously, fans of the JV team in LA. Enjoy your Drew League jerseys, your mediocre record, and collide for like half a season. Still got 17 more rings, though. Got him! Anyway, all right, that's going to do it for the show today. Thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I am Jock Slade. I'll see you next week. If you'd like to possibly be featured in a future episode, call us at 818-493-9325. Leave a short message, your social if you want. No more than 30 seconds. All right, I'll see you guys next week, and have a happy Thanksgiving. Peace.